And I remember we were dancing and he looked at me as a, he was a professional dancer and he looked at me and he said, oh, you've got a little bit of queen in you. And I was mortified. Hello, my name's Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there and the people that they used to know. Now, if you have ever lost yourself, found yourself, shaken off your inhibitions and or forged community on a dance floor, then I think there might be something in this week's episode for you. I had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure, dare I say, of talking to Trevor Campbell, who is the host of the podcast You Made Me Queer, about Toronto's lost space, The Gladstone, and its midweek dance party, Hump Day Bump, where Trevor was found cutting a rug many a night in the noughties. We talked all about learning to accept the freak you are, figuring out when to put aside your dreams, and my favorite topic of all time, weird things that people say that they think are compliments, but which actually just completely fuck with your head. Hmm, let's get into it. So when I first moved to Toronto, I was an actor. This is approximately 300 years ago. (gasps) So wait, do you stop being an actor or is that not just something that's in your blood? No, I would say that's like a poet or like a finger painter. Certain professions you always Uh are, it's just dormant. But an actor is something you... (laughs) <laughs> turn, turn on, on and, and off. off yeah okay all right all right cool. yeah you have a card you surrender they shred it when you anyway so i was an actor at the mm-hmm. time and because of that as is the case with many many performers you have a gig and then when you don't have a gig you're desperately looking for a job for the four months or whatever and there's a dark hole inside and there's a dark hole inside and you're always hungry And Mm -hmm. you're always complaining, but you look amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, at this time, this was, I think, 2007. I was dating this guy and talking to him about, you know, I need a job, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, my friend knows someone at the Gladstone. And I think maybe I'd been there one time. And it was so cool at the time. And the Gladstone is and was a hotel. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like... Rooms are rented by the hour, wink, wink, at the Gladstone. <gasps> Sorry, I'm too excited about No, this, this is a good story. <laughs> it was built by the train tracks, like when Toronto had its sort of like Victorian explosion back in the day, mm-hmm. it was the edge of town. And then it fell into sort of disrepair as that train track stopped being a main thoroughfare for the city. Mm-hmm. And then eventually it was like, how convenient, a hotel by the train track? We're going to rent these rooms by the hour for <sighs> who knows what. And then it was bought by the wonderful queer child of a sort of a star architect in Toronto who designed some of our big buildings. Wait, a star architect? That's a star architect. Exactly. So, okay, all right. Yeah, cool. star architect. I'm stuck on that if I didn't cover it. No, I'm glad you did. So, yeah, so anyway, Christina Zeidler was her name, and she was a super cool, like, filmmaker, artist, queer, and she bought the Gladstone for, like, a song. Mm-hmm. And. She was cool. She's like, I want to make this a queer community art space. It's still going to be a hotel. But she kept the staff who were there when it was hourly because she's like, I don't want to gentrify this any more than I am. And so anyway, it became this like queer kind of freaky deaky hotel with beautiful renos and like four bars in it. And the whole thing just felt a bit run by the kids in a way that no other place I'd seen was. Okay, so there's a few things to unpack. Mm. The run by the kids, what do you mean by that? I mean, she was, I want to say late 30s at the time maybe, and she was like uh-huh. boss, boss, boss. Yeah. And just like a arts maker. So it didn't have to go through this sort of weird corporate lens. It was just like if your friend who has the weird pop-up theater space 
or like makes a zine suddenly was running a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 2007, mm. your boyfriend suggested that you get a job here. Yeah. What was your boyfriend's name and how did you break his heart? Alec with a C. Sorry, Alec. Great oh, guy. Alec with a C. Yeah, Ugh. we dated very briefly and uh, I don't remember. It took me a long time to cook and I was cooking through all of my 20s and by that I mean just like not fully baked, like don't taking me out of the oven yet while things mm-hmm. are kind of setting. So cooking and baking, they're different, aren't they? Yeah, but not in Canada. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we have, we're primitive here. Oh, so you were the asshole then. I have predicted that correctly. I, I wouldn't say it was an asshole, but I think I burned through that relationship pretty quickly, unfortunately. I just realized that cousin wasn't for me and probably didn't have the communication Because you got what you wanted. You got a job. And then you were just No, like, that's not why. <laughs> no. But anyway, sweet Alec, who really was a very nice guy, uh, introduced me to his friend Louise. And then Louise introduced me to Billy, who was the bartender there, one uh-huh. of the bartenders. So I applied for this job and uh, it very much felt like Everyone there was just cool and like weird and cool. And I was like, oh my God, like being given a job there was kind of like being tapped on the shoulder by the in crowd. Oh, yeah. And somehow I did get hired. That's so exciting. I was just thinking the other day about how my dream when I was a teenager was working in a record store. Oh, so cool. And they would never hire me because I was so uncool. No, it's their loss. I never got to live that fantasy. I once got a job in a department store and it was like during the Christmas holiday, like uh, leading up to Christmas. And I was so excited because you got to like say what your preference was. And I was like, I want to be in the music section, blah, blah, blah. And then they put me in like the young men's fashion and I was so gutted. No, because you almost got your dream. Yeah, yeah. I will say, I don't know what folks in the UK who work in record stores look like, but you look exactly like someone who would work in a North American record store. <laughs> Angry and wizened? No, like a hoodie and a little beanie, got a little scruffy beard. <laughs> Perfect. Right, right. I'll book my flight. That's right. Working holiday visa. The one record store that's left. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Give me a job. <laughs> so... You were like anointed as one of the chosen. Somehow I got in and it really did feel like, maybe to go with what you said, have you seen the movie Empire Records? I have, but I don't really remember it. Well, it's just... Oh, someone shaved their head, didn't they? Oh, yeah, I think someone does. That's not part of this story, but it felt like it was like this kind of like crew and like when I think about that movie they're like young and very like stylish yeah, yeah. and fun and they're all related to Aerosmith the, yes related to Aerosmith it was just like a, a culture that was really like alive with young raw energy yeah and that's what this place felt like <gasps> yeah cool everyone was like a bartender but also a painter or like mm-hmm. a dancer but also a whatever like everyone had some weirdo side hustle and tons of queer people so many queer people. And it was like such an alternative space that to not be queer was sort of the anomaly there. Like Mm -hmm, everyone mm -hmm. was just different. And one of the biggest queer parties in Toronto at the time, because Toronto has a gay village, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. as many cities do. And as is often the case, that's, I don't think the most interesting place for queer life So the Gladstone was like the dead center of the fringe queer part of town. And it had this gay party called Hump Day Bump on Wednesday. And I thought it was, there was nowhere I would rather be. Elaborate. It was always packed. You would not get in if you did not get there early. It was just like cute and super sexy and like a place that as someone who like had to come in through the queer community kind of through the side door. I was like a bit of a weird looking guy. Uh, It just felt like somewhere that I fit in immediately. Let's talk about coming in through the side door. Mm. What do you mean? Yeah, well, I was kind of at that time, I guess like if you want to pin me to a type, I was kind of twinky, but I don't know. I, I maybe just in my own mind, I really felt like I didn't, know how to fit in with those people. I was raised intensely Catholic, so like had mega sex repression and shame. Um, Mm. And also as someone who's in the performing arts, had just like mega (laughs) repression and shame in general, where I was like, 
my whole profession had me dealing with feelings of like, I'm not good enough and I'm not working as much as I want to. And like, I think I just had a real big like mountain to climb over yeah. to find myself. So, so you've talked about the being a performer as being shameful because of the lack of opportunities that you were able to find. Or yeah, just the rejection you face. Yeah. But is that also like, oh, I need to present in a certain way because that's going to increase my likelihood of being cast? Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. And it's something I've talked to people a lot about since in that when I was in theater school, I had a lot of adults and faculty say to me, you're really lucky because you read a straight and that's such a gift that you have. And I really internalized that in a Oh, just like what a horrible thing to say. <laughs> so, said that. so many people said that to me. You're so naturally gifted at appearing straight. They were truly <laughs> like, you don't know how lucky you are. And I was like, oh, well, they're professionals. They must be right. So it was a really perverted sort of badge of honor that I had mm -hmm. as I was coming into my sexuality of like, I'm not one of those gays. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, think now thinking about it, the Gladstone was the first place and it was so diversely queer, whereas a lot of bar, unless it's a lesbian yeah. bar, it's just cis male gay men. Yeah, but yeah, the Gladstone yeah. was like really early on back then, you know, like lesbians, queer folks, lots of trans folks were there, um, gender not conforming people, drag queens thrown in with everyone else. Like it was something that was being validated that I had kind of like subconsciously been told was not valid. Yeah. And can we just have a chat about this twink thing as well? Sure. I always wonder who happily calls themselves a twink. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> like that. Because I think that. it has such negative connotations. I don't really get it. Well, how do you connote twink? Connote. I just like a bit vapid and a bit nothing, a bit flavorless. Yeah, I think so. Like some sort of like accidentally beautiful sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't even know it. They're just like, ooh, and then. Yeah, who hasn't had to work for it? Yeah, I find it really weird when people are like, yeah, I'm a twig. Like, oh, you're like, you like, you're not ashamed of that? I know. It's funny because <laughs> now I think like the gold twink standard is Timothy Chalamet. If I think of a twink, I think of Timothy Chalamet. Okay who I don't even think identifies as queer in any capacity. I don't know enough about him. But I you feel can like picture he has him. a floppy fore forehead. He has, <laughs> he has a floppy fringe is what I mean to say. He does have a floppy fringe. He's just very like... Oh, lithe. That's a good lithe, word. Lithe, yes. They're yeah. sort of like a bit like doe-eyed and just everything's sort of accidental. They're just sort of stumbling around. I was not that kid I or, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like young 20-something. I was very... As a counterpoint to feeling I was inherently flawed all the time, I was also like, I'm very outspoken. I'm quite brash in some ways. I'm a joker. What? Yeah. So it was like a weird sort of like. You're not brash. I am brash in the sense that I'm very, I, I don't mean it as a, a negative idea, but I'm, I'm someone who would rather say too much. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I get that. You are an over explainer. Yeah. But you're not <laughs> Excuse like. Excuse rude. Yeah. <laughs> But you're not like, um, I, I would interpret brash as creating friction. And I think you're way too polite for that. Well, how God bless you. I think I found a way to No, I didn't to say like, that was a good thing. No, that's touche. I, I think I found a way to harness that and use it for good. Whereas in my 20s, I was a little bit more of a poke the bear kind of guy. See it and say it, yeah. Yeah, but not not to cause problems, but just like it was part of my sense of humor that I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so it would sometimes get me into trouble, I think. And I'm, I'm pretty silly, so I liked that kind of aspect of like absurdism. Yeah. And it can be hard to find the right way, that, you know, to fit in with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it can be very easy to sink like a lead balloon and then feel as though you're never going to meet anyone who understands where you're coming from, right? Were you an absurd twink too? I mean, I don't think I could ever call myself a twink. <laughs> it's too like hairy and round. But, oh, yeah. bless. But so how did you then, with all of that going around, with you not feeling like, oh, this is where I can identify and this is where I fit in and, oh, I should be proud of the fact that I'm straight presenting. How did you then interact with your queerness? 
Yeah, it was it, like in fits and starts. And I think the reason why events like Hump Day Bump and places like the Gladstone, why I think of them as so pivotal in my queer awakening is through dancing, which was like, mm. I think the most transgressive thing for me as I navigated that. So thinking about myself as, you know, you're so lucky because you're whatever, straight presenting, blah, blah, blah. But I love dancing and I loved going to these nights. It felt like I could tap into a secret part of me that I couldn't tap into elsewhere. And I think it was the way I got to move my body because my body and the way I moved it was so policed. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but who was policing it? Well, me, spoiler, but also <laughs> because other people, like, you know, the things people the have been- The weight of expectation from yeah, everyone else. People yeah. who, and you know, not even covertly, but just saying like, if you want to su succeed in this field, you need to play these roles and all of these roles are cis, male, hetero. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, that's how I got to be. But when I danced, I, uh. you, I couldn't really dance like that. So it was the only place where I got to, you know, bend my wrist or like move my hips or do things that I couldn't do anywhere else. Mm, mm. Ah, that's really interesting. So my experience with the way I presented and the way that people interacted with me was different mm. in that everyone was like, oh yeah, you gay. But <laughs> I think I got the same release from dancing. Nice. And maybe it was because of the permission that the dance floor gives you. Oh, that sounds so wanky. No, it's but totally <laughs> true. It is a weird liminal space that is somewhat supernatural. Yeah, yeah. And suddenly people are comfortable with you acting in a certain way, whereas they wouldn't outside of that space. And it's so funny because it's literally like sometimes these places have a line a around the dance floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like suddenly step over this and like you can just be doing this all of a sudden or like... Oh, you need to describe that for our listeners. Oh, yeah. If you're a, Trevor on the wiggled. podcast, you really just missed out. <laughs> I undulated. Um, but like the way I could like get close to someone I'd never met or touch them or that for me was like queer nirvana. That was... What I so tell me more about this touching of people. Touching of people. <laughs> <laughs> right. As someone who has never touched. No, just is there, are there specific people that you touched on the dance floor? No, do you know what it is? It was, I remember l discovering with joy that feeling of the way you have to push through bodies on a dance floor and there's <gasps> just no way around it. That's joy? Yeah. Like as someone who was very didn't know how to physically connect with people mm -hmm. in any capacity. Oh, you did it by stealth. <laughs> I did, that's right. That's by stealth. No, but you know what I mean? When you're on a dance floor and it's hot and sweaty and like, even if people aren't meaning to, there's just like elbows in your side or legs against you. You're just part of the, the mass. Oh, see, I hate that. I love that. This is where I disagree. I prefer my own space. So mm. I can pirouette, obviously. Oh, she's a show pony. <laughs> no, but like when you're feeling the music, you know, I can't predict where it's going to take me. Yeah, I get that. You need space. And, <laughs> you know, if there's a medium, there's a happy medium. I don't want to be like that all night. Oh, but I yes, do like yeah, when yeah. I'm like, oh, I got to like get through and everyone's just like, it feels like a weird kind of like implicit acceptance. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I get that. Like, so not sardines, but not like you've got two meters around you. Yeah, yeah, it's just like we're here together. And negotiating that space. I think the oh, problem yeah. that I have is when people are very drunk and they're no longer negotiating that space with you, they're just Yeah, I don't like still. that. I don't yeah, like that's, that. That's super annoying. I think I just want to move through like that and then get to a space where I'm then, you know, <gasps> I can pirouette or do whatever. And so do we want to talk about your very first day? Oh, wow. I wonder if, I don't really remember. I know it was like in, I don't remember the name. I think it was just called the cafe. It was like the main <laughs> dinner service space and where you'd come like get a coffee, obviously. So I was in there. And if you worked in the cafe, you did everything. So you would waiter, you would bartend, you would be like a barista. And I think I was pretty nervous in that I just really wanted to fit in with the staff. And I've worked places where I did not fit in with the staff, but oh. the Gladstone worked. So what's your approach to meeting new people? And at what point do you show them the freaky side? Then or now? 
let's do a contrast and comparison. Okay, so my approach now, what do I do? I like to get past the small talky part because no one oh, knows how to boring. live in that space so and boring. no one cares. Yeah. yeah. So I tend to just start asking questions like we're friends and behaving like we're friends and that seems to work pretty well oh. instead of like, oh, I shouldn't be too comfortable yet. Yeah. Um, I think people like that. I, I like it at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was very, I think I was very much like, don't screw this up. You somehow got this job by accident. You were not cool enough to be Aww. here. And so just like, be cool, man. And it, then it just kind of worked out. And I oh. think I was like there too. Like, because I would go dancing there and stuff, like, I was just kind of part of the scene, mm -hmm, maybe. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. part of the scene. So you went from a place of not feeling like you fit in to feeling like you fit in? Am I putting words in your mouth? I think I did. Here's the thing. Yes, I did feel like I fit in. I think I always have a little chip in my head, or I did at the time that was like... Chip in your head or chip on your shoulder? No, in my head. I'll explain. Okay. At that time, that was like, you're not part of this, you're on the outside of this, it was yeah. just sort of my entire mm, adolescence. Mm, and mm. it was really hard to shake that. And honestly, I think it's, I have a shadow of it that I'll maybe always have. But at the time I was like, this is working. It shouldn't be working because something's inherently wrong with you. Yeah. Even amongst queers. Um, so just be cool. And... And it worked and it was good, but I think I always felt like an outsider even there. And I am taking from what you said that that's dulled somewhat. Yeah, I, th I certainly care way less, which has solved a lot of it. And I don't know, you know, I think some of that was tied to a bit of 22-year-old narcissism too, where you think everyone's thinking about you. Like yeah, yeah. they don't like my clothes or my attitude or my whatever and you're like no one's thinking about you they're all thinking about themselves <laughs> and that really took the edge off and how everyone is thinking about that everyone else is thinking about how their yeah. outfit's awful yeah exactly so that's why I podcast because then i can only be judged on the sweet honey tones of my voice <laughs> and I don't know if everyone just has imposter syndrome and is carrying it around. Yeah, I wonder, hey? Yeah, and, and then there's only some of us that, that are able to be honest about it or... I think it's easier to be honest about yeah. it now because of the way sort of the conversation has moved. But I think it's a really common experience for queer folks, which is just such a shame when a minority community also sort of like replicates those structures or if you carry those structures into the community it's like mm -mm. all the weirdos go over here and then even amongst the weirdos you're like am i the weirdest one <laughs> but, uh, yeah but it's all learned behavior isn't it like, i know so, you know you can't expect a group of people to come together and then create different rules from the ones they've been immersed in uh, you're totally right we reproduce that a lot but also i'd say to answer your question to like I've found ways to get around that and to not believe it, but also it really matters to me less and less how I'm taken, mm. which is really nice. Yeah, and just being like, wow, it's great you don't like me. See you later. <laughs> no, not that. I mean, that's certainly one approach, but I'm more just like, I don't have to be all things for all people. What a great relief that you can, you know, Mr. Algorithm or whatever. <laughs> you can hurt me or don't hurt me, but I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Why are you gendering the algorithm as a male? Oh, yeah, I did say Mr. Algorithm. I mean, don't you think, though? I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? So, okay, so you were there for four years. Yeah. Are there any particular moments or events that stick out in your mind from that period? Yeah, so one thing about this place that sticks out in my mind too is there were so many weird little secret hallways kind of going around. Ah. And every now and then someone would be like, can you go get me the such and such that's in that hallway? And I'd be like, there's a hallway over there? So it honestly felt like some weird kind of Mary Poppins bag where we were just constantly like finding new places and new things. Um, I mean, it, I'm avoiding the first one I think of, which is so weird. One that's really etched in my mind was when I was serving there and the head chefs, and this is fairly common in the restaurant industry, the head chefs were 
not nice people, like total jerks. <laughs> and I remember having this big crudité platter that I had to carry out. And I somehow, it was just like in one hand and I'm like, I'll also carry all these things. And I dropped the whole crudité platter. And the chef got so mad, someone had to separate us and escort me away. So what? he didn't lose his mind. Yeah. Wow. He was so mad. So that seems to be the memory I have the most. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. But otherwise, I made really nice friends there. Um, so it just feels like this soft punk space. There's always good music playing. I'm always kind of tired, but in a really ni- nice way. <laughs> So then in the four years, yeah. so there's four years, so 2007 to 2011. Roughly, there, roughly. Thereabouts. Yeah. yeah. What was happening in your life then at that time? I was just getting out of performing, like the long death rattle of my performance career before I accepted, I don't think this is going to take me to retirement. What is that like? What do you mean? H- having that conversation with yourself. Uh, it's a conversation you have many times. Well, you're like, no, it'll be okay. And then you get some weird gig for $200 a week in a little town and you're like, I'm saved. And then you're like, actually, this strangely isn't fulfilling being sailor number nine in South Pacific (laughs) in this town. (laughs) And like you fought tooth and nail to get, and maybe you can relate too. like at the time, I thought it was the only way I could be my creative self. Yeah. And then you discover there are other ways to do that. Have you had that experience? Well, I don't know. Did you always want to be a podcaster? No, but I don't know if I ever stop on things. They're just temporarily put to one side Mm -hmm. and then maybe never picked up again. But (laughs) I've never had that conversation of like, no. Well, listen, I didn't either at the time, like... It didn't, and you know, I joke, I'm a retired actor or whatever, but there was no decisive moment ever. I just put my focus elsewhere. Okay. Um, And certainly like the skills I've learned there, I use now the work I do in radio and podcasting and things like that. And it's, it's nice to be someone who's been so embarrassed through their profession that it's impossible to be embarrassed anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yay. Yay. Yay for humiliation and degradation. Oh my God. I truly, I recommend theater school to anyone who thinks like there's no end to their shame because you will hit the bottom. (sighs) Yeah. And then you just claw your way back up. But at anyway, that time, anyway, so yeah, you yeah. moved into music. Yeah, but to answer your question, I then I moved into graphic design and I applied for this program, like a funding program to study graphic design. And I got the call that I got in hilariously at the Gladstone. Ah. So I got a, a call on my cell phone and even though I was like waiting tables, just went into the bathroom. <laughs> and I, I remember being in this tiny bathroom and just being like, ah. Oh, my life is about to change. But also while working there, I would get calls that I booked gigs and stuff and I would just always run in that bathroom. So that I got a lot of good news in that bathroom. Aww. <laughs> yeah. Any other kind of good news? I never had sex in that bathroom. Aww. Aww. I never had sex at the Gladstone. I made. Did I make out with people? I assume I did. Oh, you must have. I had at least one birthday at the Gladstone. But, <laughs> which means <laughs> I mean, you got to kiss someone on your birthday. Do you? Do you? In Canada. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's round off this okay. four year period. Okay. So you had these calls in the bathroom. Yes. Uh, you went into graphic design. That's yeah. where we were. And that's kind of where I I think started because I had to go back to school for it. So I quit the Gladstone, mm. and then shortly after that. A lot of people left. It was kind of like a changing of the guard. And I had less reasons to go back and see friends. And then the ownership changed and it just felt like the moment passed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's still someplace that I have so much fondness for. It was like so, such such a turning point in my life, 100%. How did you find out that it was no longer going to be the Gladstone? So I remember following it for a while and just because everything in Toronto is gentrifying so quickly and it's becoming mm-hmm. so expensive, we were like, there's no way this weird 35-whatever-room boutique hotel, like, how is this going to work? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then I think I just kind of heard a rumor. Yeah. And so when you found out, were you like, oh, yeah, I was expecting this? Or was there some other response? I think because it was such a slow evolution, it didn't feel like anything sort of cataclysmic or like really like, you know, something would change. It felt like it had been changing for a while. And certainly like my my queerness had wasn't anchored there anymore. Mm -hmm. But when I think about it and talk about it like this, to be honest, I do get a little like sadly nostalgic for it, just for that time, like how exciting it all felt, you know? So what did it teach you about yourself? And you know what, especially it being outside of the neighborhood in Toronto, it really encouraged me to like look to the fringes for my people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, really like kindred spirits there that I'm not, you know, like a thoroughfare twink or whatever, like those boys on the... Thorough, thoroughbred or thoroughfare? No, I know you keep trying to to catch me with your Oxford English, but no, thoroughfare, like Main Street gay. I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm trying to clarify. <laughs> trying to understand. I know. And this is part of my problem is that it sounds like I'm making up all my own phrases, which I might be. But I mean, like, it, it reminded me, like, you, your people are not in the middle. Your people mm -hmm. are on the sides. And the joy I, I got in that and the acceptance I got there. And that's really where I think I started to understand the queer community is not just gay men. Thank goodness. Oh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and then to do the full-on cheese moment. Take me there. Which I know you've just been, like, dying for I love time cheese. We've been talking. Yeah. Let's go back to the conversation that Alec had with you, Alec with a C. Alec with a C. When he was like, oh, do you know what? I've got a friend who works at the Gladstone. Maybe they can hook you up with a job. Let's just like forget Alec and pretend he's not there anymore. I'm making this really convoluted. Uh, I'm and, with you. And the you of today is next to the you of 2007. What advice would you give him? And don't give me any kind of comical, funny thing here. Let's get full on cheese. Let's go deep. And this is not authenticity, it's not cheese. So <laughs> hang on. So you're saying what advice would I give pre-Gladstone? Yeah. Trev, who was like trying to figure out, uh, wow, what would I say? Honestly, I'm just trying not to be mega trite, but the seed of it is like, you know who you are, you know what you want to be, and that is going to be enough for people, the people that are going to matter to you. You don't need to figure out how to like what other people like. I think I kept trying to figure out, like, what's my way into this? Or maybe if I learn about this or go to this thing, it'll rub off on you. And you'll like that or you'll become interested in that. You'll become that kind of person instead of just, like, my challenge has always been that I always knew exactly who I was and I was mm. afraid to stay there. Mm. It's so easy to stop fighting that. And it, when I finally let myself, what a joy it was, but man, I took the long way around. Mm. So I would say, don't do that. Uh, I like <laughs> that. I like that. It can be so much easier. Yes, because it's so easy to confuse yourself when you're an overthinker. Oh my God, can you relate? Mm-hmm. Like, I just didn't trust my instincts. And, like, dancing is the perfect crystallization of that for me, which is inherently queer and so rooted in the Gladstone. Like, nothing is more natural than dancing. Like, the way you move your body, the way you move to music. Like, when you're in a club, it's not like you went to a dance class to learn that. These are all just, like, movements that come out. And nothing is worse than watching someone, like, try and do, like, a thing that... They think that is dancing, that sort of like pseudo, like what is that? Why do we spend our lives doing that? Oh, you've made the link, I see. And you know what's funny is I remember this moment with this other guy I was dating named Brendan, who was a dancer, who was so cute. And we went to this bar called The Barn on Church Street, we went dancing one night, and he was someone I was like desperately trying to impress at all times. And I remember we were dancing and he looked at me as a, he was a professional dancer and he looked at me and he said, oh, you've got a little bit of queen in you. And I was mortified that my takeaway was like, oh my God, you were dancing like a 
a queen. Like what? That you can't do that. I really took that and was like, be careful. I don't know. It was very embarrassing for me, which is so funny because I mean, like, to think about how many times those parts of me tried to come out and how many times I pushed them back down. Mm. And now uh, she's a queen, baby. <laughs> she's the queen. She's the queen. <laughs> <laughs> ah. That's my advice. Be a queen. You're a queen. Be a queen. Do you have any memories of the Gladstone or clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, I would love to hear all about it. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but I need your help. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space to tell me all about what it is you got up to. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Trevor by giving You Made Me Queer a little listen, and you can find that wherever you find podcasts, obviously, or give him a wee follow on Instagram and Twitter, where his handle is You Made Me Queer. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told somebody else who you think might be interested in giving it a wee listen to. My name is Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. <laughs>